thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Ayad Akhtar, and I am the president of PEN America. <laughs> thank you, thank you. After two years of virtual programming, we're thrilled to be back in person. This is our 18th Penn World Voices Festival. The festival's mission since its inception in 2005 is to bring together voices from around the globe in dialogue across borders, language, and culture. For those of you new to Penn America, we are a member-driven organization. We have members in every US state and chapter cities across the country, from Detroit to Tulsa, from Birmingham to Miami. We welcome all of you to join in bringing our mission to life. We'd love to see you at the membership table following the event right outside. For those of you who are new to PEN America, we are an organization of writers whose mission is to unite writers and those who love what writers do. At root, we're about championing freedom of thought, freedom of the imagination, and freedom of expression. We're member-driven with members in every US state, which I just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before my first cup of coffee in the morning. I want to thank our presenting sponsors tonight, New York State Council on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, Amazon Crossing, Amazon Literary Partnership, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, and to thank our bookstore partner, the Strand Bookstore. Finally, special thanks to the Curatorial Committee, Clarice Rosas Sharif, Eloisa Amescua, John Freeman, Deviani Saltzman, and Louise Steinman. And for those of you watching on Crowdcast, welcome. Now for tonight's program. The, two, 20, the 2022 Arthur Miller Freedom to Write Lecture with novelist and Penn Ukraine President Andrei Kirchhoff. Arthur Miller served as president of Penn International from 1965 to 1969. And this lectureship honors his unflinching defense of creative freedom, both as an advocate and through his writings. In delivering tonight's lecture, Andre Kirchhoff joins a long line of literary luminaries from around the world, including Arundhati Roy, Umberto Eco, Orhan Pamuk, Salman Rushdie, Wallace Soyinka, among many others. Following the lecture, Andre Kirchhoff will be joined in conversation with the author of Little Failure and Our Country Friends, the New York Times bestselling novelist, Gary Stengart. Before we welcome Andre to the stage, I'd like to introduce Ukrainian poet and translator, Ia Kiva, who is with us from Kyiv and will be performing one of her poems in Ukrainian. Good evening. Біженці театр. Першу ніч у безпечному місці. Так, ми кажемо про захід країни. Ти проводиш на підлозі театру, мов реквізит до війни, яку можна дивитись у вільному доступі, відразу в усіх очах переляканих насмерть тварин. Ви ще встигаєте купити квиток у перший ряд Третьої світової. Писав напередодні великої повені відомий західний журналіст. Світло падає добре, і світ встигає побачити бруд у тебе під нігтями, і ще довге, нестрижено з Польщі волосся, яке потріскує єврейськими гілками родоводу, коли крейда добра креслить на ньому хрест. А манікюру в тебе немає вісім років, як його не було. І коли ти читаєш це за ту жінку з Бучі, шкільні вчителі розкажуть про цю фотографію. Під шиїм садочком вишневим на пещених пальцях то питаєш червоної фарби, чи їй не соромно за це порівняння. Але нам, мов марцисам, у бабусь на зупинках, тепер ніколи не соромно. Бути і не бути, 
Яркими цибулинами дерев, що ростуть на узбіччі історії. Це за кілька днів ти йтимеш проспектом свободи, це не метафора, щоб кинути всі віщі сни на підлогу чоловічої перукарні. Але це не рятує, мов божевільний злезом туги під нігтями, пам'ять водить тебе запиленим полем з мертвими картоплинами. Таким довгим, що ти і в дітей бачиш землю замість очей. А нині ти лежиш на підлозі театру, мов реквізит, і здригаєшся від зеленчання трамваїв. Цих цивільних півчих у хорі військової авіації. І не можеш виїняти візк, звук любителів сучасної музики. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. And now, please join me in welcoming the president of Penn Ukraine, author of Death and the Penguin and Gray Bees, and this year's Arthur Miller Freedom to Write lecture, Andrei Kirkhoff. Good evening. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues in Pan America, I thank you all for the opportunity to be here and to speak to you. I am grateful to you for supporting Ukraine because it is thanks to your support and the support of the democratic part of humanity that Ukraine has been fighting now for its freedom for two and a half months against the Russian army, which is much larger, but as it turned out, not much stronger than the Ukrainian army. Ukrainians are determined to win, to defend the sovereign right to life in their own free and democratic country. Ukrainians in this war are united not only by a common enemy, but also by a common European vision of the future of their state. Ukraine doesn't really have a choice. It will either win and remain an independent state, or as President Putin wants, become part of the new Soviet Union or the new Russian Empire. When I think about the current situation in Ukraine and about what I must say today, I get the impression that I should be given not the Arthur Miller lecture, but the George Orwell lecture. Russian aggression has stretched its stealing grip out to us as if from the distant Soviet past, from the 20th century, from a country in which there is a ministry of truth and a ministry of happiness, from a country where the massacre of civilians and the destruction of cities is accompanied by the music of Shostakovich and Tchaikovsky, from a country where even monuments to Pushkin are dressed in military uniforms and forced to take part in the fight against Ukraine and against Ukrainian identity and culture. I have a lot of questions. How did this become possible in the 21st century, in the era of high technology, in the era of world economic, political, and cultural cooperation? I am not yet ready to answer all these questions, but I do not ignore them. I write down my answers so that I can later compare my answers with the opinions of the recognized analysts and political scientists. And I am learning to live in wartime. I have learned to be an internally displaced person. I know what to do during shelling. I am mastering a new layers of knowledge without which it is difficult to survive and act effectively during a war. I have learned how to travel from Ukraine to Europe and this time even to the USA. I have learned to return to Ukraine as quickly as possible. Above all, I have learned not to write fiction. Previously, I could not have imagined a situation in which I would decide not to write a novel. But it has happened. Reality is now scarier, more dramatic than any fictional prose. In this context, novels lose their meaning. 
Now it is necessary to write only the truth, only non-fiction. All those who can write are witnessing one of the worst crimes of the 21st century. The task of a witnesses is to record and preserve the evidence of the crime. Yes, now I am a witness in a future criminal trial. And even if this process takes place later than I would like, my testimony, like the testimony of dozens of other Ukrainian writers and journalists, will be claimed by the judges. On the 1st of May, I sat in my car at the Ukrainian-Slovak border for five hours in order to leave war-torn Ukraine, in order to get to Denmark and from Denmark to get here to New York for this meeting. The distance you have to cover does not become longer when the flat race course is converted into steeplechase course. The distance is simply filled with new meaning and it requires new strength and new understanding from those who want to overcome this distance. The same thing happens with any tasks. War changes the rules for solving tasks, but does not make the desired result impossible. Today, the task for Ukraine is to defend its independence, defend its freedom and complete the reforms that should have been fully implemented long ago. To forge any change, you need to know the truth of the situation. For any decision making in war or in peacetime, without an understanding the true state of affairs, it is impossible to achieve a result. You cannot even choose the right route to the goal. I'm always surprised when Google Maps tells me that a 40 kilometer car journey will take two hours. Yes. I am always unpleasantly surprised in this situation, but I am not angry at Google Maps. I am angry about the bad roads. Google Maps is just telling me the so-called unpleasant truth. There are many people in the world who believe that the truth must necessarily be unpleasant. I myself have often heard in my life the words, I would like to tell you an unpleasant truth. And in such situations, the question always worries me. Those people who believe that the truth is most likely unpleasant, do they live in a lie? Do they live in self-deception? Do they hide from the truth so that they can maintain themselves in a pleasant and carefree life? The truth cannot be pleasant or not pleasant. The truth can only be the truth, what a person does with it. How he perceives this truth is a personal matter for each one. Whether they hide from it or, on the contrary, arm themselves with the truth and brandishing it, charge forward in life, this is a personal choice. In his place, author Miller brought the truth about American life about the problems faced by immigrants, about the delusions that consciously or unconsciously lead people to what false values and false narratives lead people to. His voice was powerful and it was heard by many. But it was those many who wanted to hear the voice of truth. Those who did not want to hear it tried to make sure that the voice could not be heard at all. Miller always fought for his rights and especially for the freedom to write and say what he thought. Neither did he tire of fighting for the rights and freedoms of other writers. Thanks to the efforts of Otha Miller and the American Pan International Pan, the Nigerian writer Vole Shoinka, who later became a living world classic and Nobel laureate, was saved from death. Otha Miller's work as president of international pen deserves special attention. Otha Miller was never silent. In addition, he did not want others to be silent. He wanted everyone to enjoy freedom of speech and other freedoms. He tried to involve Soviet writers in a discussion about human rights. He traveled to Moscow and talked to them about the possibility of registering a Soviet pen club. Soviet writers were ready for this, provided that the pen charter was changed. 
provided that international pen ceased to protect freedom of speech and other freedoms. Arthur Miller would never agree to this condition. The conversation with Soviet writers led nowhere. They were not free. They depended on the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. They wanted to depend on the government because this government fed them, paid for their more or less comfortable lives. This conversation with Soviet writers spoke more about the role of writers and literature in the Soviet Union than about the naivety of Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller gave Soviet writers a chance to become part of world literature. He did not understand that Soviet writers were primarily servants of the regime and not thinkers or philosophers. They did not depend on their readers. To a great extent, they did not influence them either. Later, when his plays were banned in the USSR, he was at first perplexed by the ban. Surely there was nothing anti-Soviet in his plays. In the end, he realized how he had become the enemy of the Soviet people. And then he understood much better the nature of a totalitarian society and the role of literature and of writers in such a society. Arthur Miller has not been with us for 17 years, but his voice continues to resound in the world and continues to turn the thoughts of hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of people back to the search for truth and justice. Because truth and justice cannot be separated. They are interconnected. A person who experiences the sharp pain of injustice in whatever way can become a champion of truth. Such a person is usually ready to fight for this truth and, if necessary, to die for it. I have always tried to avoid pathos. And if I cannot avoid it now, please forgive me. Pretentious words like truth, justice, motherland used to set my teeth on edge. I could not by doubt but doubt the sincerity of the speaker if, of course, I was not utterly convinced of their insincerity. Now I catch myself thinking pretentious thoughts. I try to muffle them. I try to think about what is happening calmly and coolly. But to be honest, I don't always succeed. When the new bloodier phase of Russian aggression began on February 24th of this year, when the shock of the first days of the new war had passed, I found myself wanting to look back and say, Thank you to everyone who had been with me in my pre-24th of February life and who had helped me make my life interesting, useful, fulfilling, and meaningful. The first name that came to my mind was the name of my country, my Ukraine. Ukraine is a country of individualists. Every Ukrainian has his own personal Ukraine. Every Ukrainian appreciates something special about his motherland something that is important for her or him. It might be the country's amazing and diverse nature. It might be the fertile black soil that produces 10% of the world's wheat. For me, Ukraine is, first of all, the space of my personal freedom. This is a country that since 1991 has given me more than 30 years of life and work without censorship, without political control without pressure. Even today, during the Russian aggression, during attacks that every day take the lives of Ukrainian citizens, military and civilian, the government of Ukraine has not introduced real military censorship and has not told citizens what to say and what to think. Yes, of course, information about what is happening on the fronts of the war is not freely dispersed we have had to learn new rules of behavior regarding information. But even in wartime, the Ukrainian state has remained essentially democratic, trying not to restrict the freedoms of citizens, including the freedom of speech. Ukrainians do not accept diktats or restrictions on their rights, especially the right to freedom of speech or freedom of religion. For Ukrainians, freedom has always been more important than money, more important than living standards, more important than stability. In fact, there has never been stability in Ukraine precisely because freedom was a priority. 
unlike the Russians, for whom it seems stability is more important than freedom and all individual freedoms and rights. Now, looking back at 30 years of life in the Soviet Union and 31 years of my life in independent Ukraine, I can only say thank you to Ukraine for helping make my dream come true. I became a writer and at the same time remained completely independent of any political conjuncture. I realized that in this happy state of mind, there is a great merit of my country, which immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union abandoned the principles of total control over the thoughts, views, and creativity of its citizens. When you live in a free country and are a free citizen, freedom seems to be something natural, something that no one can take away from you. But in fact, even with the freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution of Ukraine in our country, there has always been a struggle between those who wanted to tell the truth and those who wanted to make it inaccessible. First of all, it was not politicians who took part in this struggle but journalists. The number of casualties among representatives of honest journalism testify to the cruelty of this struggle. Over the years of independence, about 100 journalists have died in Ukraine. In the past two months, more than 20 of them have been killed by the Russian military. Journalism remains one of the most dangerous professions. And during the war, it becomes even more dangerous. The inscription press on a bulletproof vest or helmet is to the Russian military like a red rag to bull. The level of journalism traditionally shows the level of democracy in society. We can see how independent journalism is being destroyed by the example of an ex Crimea. Immediately after the annexation, some journalists remained working in Crimea, including freelancers for Radio Liberty. One by one, they were deported from the peninsula or arrested. Citizen journalists stepped in to replace them, courageous people who understood the necessity of objective information about what was happening. Today, there are 14 Ukrainian citizen journalists are in prison in the next Crimea and in Russia against whom criminal cases have been fabricated. They are accused of terrorism or religious extremism although their only fault is that they voluntarily assumed the responsibility to cover the repression of the Russian authorities against dissidents, against those who do not recognize the annexation of Crimea, against those who do not agree with Putin's policies. Today, I want to remember by name these courageous people who have already been sentenced to long prison terms or are awaiting their sentence. They are Vladislav Yesipenko, Marlene Asanov, Asman Arif Memetov, Remzi Bekirov, Ruslan Suleimanov, Rustem Sheikhaliyev, Server Mustafaev, Seyran Saliyev, Timur Ibragimbekov, Ibragimov, Ahmed Suleimanov, Alexei Besarabov, Irina Danilovich, and former journalist, politician, and deputy chairman of the Crimean Majlis. Nariman Jalal. In addition to them, more than 200 Ukrainian citizens are in Russian prisons and in the prisons of their next Crimea on fictitious charges. Nariman Jalal, despite the 20 year prison term that hangs over him, does not hide his attitude towards the Russian occupation authorities, wishing Ukraine to defend its independence. From the Simferopol pre trial detention center, he handed over a letter which I will read to you. Dear friends, it would seem monstrous that in the 21st century, a country that took on the obligation to maintain peace, a member of the UN Security Council has become an aggressor whose actions have led to tens, tens of thousands of victims among the civilian population of Ukraine and among the defenders of our country. However, this is reality. This is the result of the actions of the Russian leadership. For many years, actions aimed at limiting human rights 
and resurrecting imperial ambitions. It is obvious that one cannot remain indifferent to this. It is necessary to unite efforts to stop the killing of people and protect peace and democracy. Many of my fellow prisoners are waiting for release not only from their personal imprisonment, they are also waiting for the release of their country into freedom. Nariman Jalal. We cannot but admire the courage of Nariman Jalal and his wife Leviza. We can't help but admire the courage of all his fellow citizen journalists and the resilience of their families, of their wives or husbands, who understand that their parents' attitude will lead to children growing up without fathers or mothers. But the children will grow up knowing why their fathers or mothers were repressed by Russia. From early childhood, they will understand the price of freedom and the price of fighting for their beliefs. For a writer and for a journalist, there is no more important freedom than the freedom to write. And if a journalist or writer continues to write, realizing that he or she can be repressed for this, this only speaks of the courage and dedication of such a person. My family's world changed on February 24th. The whole world changed on February 24th this year, when the aging and ailing President Putin gave the order to launch a crusade against Ukraine against the collective West, against democracy, and against Western civilization. Putin left Ukraine no choice but to fight for its independence to the end, to the bitter end. He left no choice to the civilized world. The world should help Ukraine, and the world does help Ukraine defend its freedom, defend all the freedoms of its citizens. Now, as I speak to you, the Russian occupation forces in the Kherson region in southern Ukraine, near the Black Sea, are trying to switch the Ukrainian internet to a Russian service and are warning residents in the occupied territories that soon they will not have access to Facebook or Instagram. That is, in this way, the invaders warn the Ukrainians that they are about to become Russians and that they must accept this as something that cannot be changed. They must give up their freedoms and rights as tens of millions of Russians have done. I know how the people who remained under occupation feel. I know what they are thinking now and my thoughts are with them. Several times I have spoken via messengers with colleagues who found themselves in the occupied zone. I have lost touch with some of them but I know that they will not accept the rules of slavery that Russia is trying to impose on Ukrainians who find themselves in the territories occupied by the Russian army. Ukrainian writers, regardless of the language they write in, will never give up the freedom to write what they think and what they consider important. Ukrainians, writers or not writers, cannot and will not learn to live without freedom, without the freedoms that are included in the mandatory and inviolable list of human rights. And now to finish my speech, I want to give you a challenge because when the speech was edited and ready yesterday, I got a message with a link to an article in the Variety magazine about personal life of Arthur Miller and about the story of his son who was born with Down syndrome and who was institu institutionalized and who was never visited by Arthur Miller in his life. This is just the truth. It's not pleasant or unpleasant. I found out it. I was shocked. And I don't know if you didn't know about this. Maybe you are surprised or you are shocked. But we should know the truth. And this is only one piece of truth which doesn't diminish Arthur Miller's works and his work for Penn International and for literature and for drama. Thank you very much.
Oh, that was wonderful. So great to see you, my friends. I'm very happy to see you because yeah. we met first time probably 2004 in Norwich in England. You remember, I always call it Norfolk, but it's Nor Norwich. Norwich, Norwich. Norwich. Yeah. Sorry to any British people out here. Uh, this is indeed a great honor for me. This is one of my favorite writers uh, in the world. Um, I've read Death and the Penguin many, many times. It was one of those things that inspires me because I love a book that has warmth and humor. Those are two of sort of my touchstones, and I think that's one of the books, and in fact, every book that you've written uh, follows in that footstep. It's a, it's a really beautiful book for those who haven't read it. Uh, also, for those who haven't read it yet, there's a wonderful new novel, Gray Bees, that I really encourage you to buy. It is, yeah, that's right. Sales. Mm. Who doesn't love a sale? Um, but it is one of those books that really helps to understand Ukraine today and the conflict that's broken out after the Russian aggression. And it takes place in three different places that, of course, are very important uh, to what has happened in the last, uh, since 2014, really. That one is the Donbass, the region where uh, Russia invaded and took over the Donetsk and Luhansk region and created these bullshit republics, people's republics. Uh, the second area, Crimea, which was also taken over, and the third, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine itself. Um, well, obviously, all those areas constitute Ukraine, too. So it's one of those books that really gives you a panorama of this whole universe that is seen through a very uh, Andrei Kurkov kind of character, a kind of everyman. Uh, that the audience, that the reader can really uh, identify with. So let me ask you a couple of questions since you're here all the way from Kyiv. And uh, when we first met, uh, well, the second time we met was in Kyiv in, um, in the neighborhood where you live. And it is one of the most, Kyiv, by the way, if you haven't been, is just an incredible city. But it's one of the most beautiful neighborhoods I would see in Eastern Europe. It's just, and boy, they can make a good steak there for you as well. So... Uh, when this is over or even before, uh, definitely a, a place you should, uh, you should visit. Um, I wanted to start with something you said during your lecture about learning to write nonfiction and learning to write in a different way. I mean, you've dealt with very fantastical themes uh, in all of your novels. Do you think that reality has in some ways after this war, after the pandemic, um, after Trump, <laughs> after Johnson, that reality has kind of outpaced the ability for us novelists, even those of us that write in a humorous or maybe satirical sense, uh, outpaced our ability to keep up. Uh, you, you think we should all just sort of, I don't know, go to journalism school or something and, and, and take up a different way of, of looking at it? Um, well, before the war, I was uh, writing uh, already a third novel about events in Kyiv, in 1919 during the civil war in Russia after October 1917 revolution. So actually I was writing about very brutal times. And uh, then actually when we were woken up with my wife at five o'clock in the morning on 24th of February by explosions uh, outside, I mean, I, I couldn't think about fiction anymore and I couldn't think at all. In fact, actually, for one hour, I was just walking from one window to another, looking out, checking, uh, is there life outside? What is happening? I mean, I knew that this was the war, but I couldn't believe it. And it took me about 40, 48 hours, actually, to accept that now it's different reality. And uh, I couldn't write anything probably for five days. And then I realized that actually I should be writing down what is happening. And I started writing articles and essays and sending them to different media. And that's what I'm doing now. And I decided not to write fiction until the war is over. So, uh, I mean, it's difficult to, to promise to oneself that you'd, you will not do this or you will not do that. But this is how it is now. It's two and a half months of the war. The situation actually, I cannot say that it's not improving. It's not uh, becoming... Uh, more dangerous. Uh, it was already very dangerous for Kyiv because Kyiv was attacked and lots of people living around Kyiv and in Kyiv were killed. In fact, actually, Kyiv is still shelled and one week ago, a journalist, Vera Girich, was killed in her new apartment that she just bought and the missile actually hit this apartment in the block of flats in the central part of Kyiv. So uh, the life is unpredictable now, it's difficult to make plans, not only about writing or not writing, but plans about tomorrow. Yeah, but uh, 
I do hope that Ukraine will win and in not so distant future. And then actually those who can come back to their previous ways of life, they will come back. And I will try to, to, to go back to writing fiction and will stop writing articles and essays. Do you think, I mean, this is always a question people ask, you know, people said after 9-11, let's wait 10 years before we write about 9-11 in America. And this is obviously a different scale of conflict. People have admonished me for writing a novel about the pandemic as it's still going on. I mean, do you think we have to take time to process what's happening before we commit it to a more, a less journalistic and a more sort of artful approach to writing? You know, I mean, uh, I discovered uh, recently that I'm conservative. <laughs> It was unpleasant discovery. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Yeah, because uh, I remember that in 1986 when Chernobyl uh, exploded and everybody was writing quickly novels and non-fiction about Chernobyl disaster and somebody was asking me, are you writing also now a book about Chernobyl? And I was saying, no, no, I will not write until uh, probably uh, the, all the consequences are known, maybe in 20 years' time, and I never... Uh, wrote uh, a book, I wrote a Christmas story about Chernobyl, uh, some kind of black humor Christmas story. Uh, and then actually when uh, this 2014 uh, war started, after annexation of Crimea and beginning of the war in Donbass, uh, lots of uh, Ukrainian writers started writing about uh, the war, about separatism, about... Uh, not about Crimea, it was interesting because actually the theme of Crimea was not really much touched upon. But about Donbass, yes. And also journalists were asking me, am I writing also something about Donbass? And I was saying, no, I will wait until the end of the war and maybe then 10 years more to understand what are the consequences and then maybe I will write something. But what happened actually three years after the beginning of the war, uh, I was talking to... Uh, young man, businessman, who moved from Donetsk uh, to Kyiv after the beginning of the, uh, this uh, occupation of Donetsk and Lugansk. And uh, we had an influx of uh, IDPs and sort of refugees and resettlers from there to Kyiv and other cities. And this young man told me that he is driving his car every month once to the front line to a village uh, which still has seven families Everybody else abandoned the village, but they don't have electricity, they don't have shops, pharmacy, post, medical services, nothing, because it's like gray zone. And gray zone is usually a strip of land between positions of war infractions. So, I mean, the, and I, I, this was the first time, actually, I started thinking about gray zone in a wider context, because, I mean, I thought that actually gray zone uh, begins inside the heads of people when they don't realize where they live, when they don't think about the country, they live or the passport they have. And uh, I mean, they can be nice people, hardworking people, completely politically passive, uh, accepting uh, uh, what, uh, advice for whom to vote from their bosses, etc. And uh, one could say the same not only about many people of Donbass, but about people of Bessarabia and Transcarpathian and other regions. Uh, because that's true, Ukrainian politicians didn't do much to integrate different regions into one national space. I mean, I, this is a separate topic, very interesting for me, and maybe I will write about this. But anyway, when he mentioned this story and that the people actually who are, uh, whom, whom he visits and helps, they give him uh, as thank you jars with pickles and things that they produce themselves, and he takes it to his cafe and sells uh, the, these jars, and, and the, the, the people who purchase them are also uh, IDPs or resettlers or refugees from the same region, uh, I decided to, to write about people of a gray zone, about civilians who were visited uh, by, unwell, I mean, by the war. I mean, the war came and remained there, and they didn't move out. They remained in their houses. And uh, at that time, there were already 200 books about the war, but mostly about soldiers, combat, battles, separatists, etc. So it, I mean, it was like very military theme. And I decided to give voice to civilians, actually, who are probably the first victims of every war. And this is how the Grey Beasts were written. And I should say that actually this Grey Zone doesn't exist anymore. It is now run over by Russia. It was 300 miles long. It was sometimes 300 meters, sometimes five miles wide. 
with dozens of villages and even a part of the town of Deivka was in the gray zone. So people lived for eight years in the gray zone in no man's land with no authority, with no help. I mean, some volunteers were coming and helping them. And there was even NGO, I think in Kharkiv, that was printing a newspaper for the gray zone and asking volunteers to bring this to people because people didn't have access to the information since they had no electricity. Yeah. Yeah, this is done really wonderfully in this novel because the gray zone is a kind of post-apocalyptic almost sounding zone, right? There's no electricity. Uh, but he brings, Andre brings these characters to life because there's two people that he uses, uh, two old kind of frenemies. Um, they're, they went to school together, but they never really got along. And one lives on Lenin Street, and the other lives on Shevchenko Street, I think, right? So one, and true to their nature, one, close, one hues closer to the Ukrainian side and the other to the Russian side. Although there are many complexities, too, and they're both Russian-speaking, of course. But um, they're, you know, the whole, that, that's sort of the way, the high bar for me of this kind of fiction that deals with politics is not ignoring this, the realities, but also humanizing them through, through concrete uh, characters. Let me ask you, did you go to the gray zone at all? Or? I was near gray yeah. zone. I mean, in 2015, with a couple of my colleagues, including Sergei Jadan, we went along the front line to the Russian border in Lugansk region, to Severodonetsk. And this was an uh, incredible experience. We are, were talking to soldiers, of course. We were talking to locals. But, I mean, those locals who would come to... Uh, talked to us, they were mostly pro-Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And then we got to Severodonetsk on the border with Russia, with front line seven kilometers away. And after a discussion with local people, I was trying to talk to uh, local people also, to local residents, and uh, the adults were turning away from me because they didn't know me. They, they, they were afraid of talking to strangers. And I was walking along the main street, which is, which is called Gvardeyski Prospect, and I saw a boy of 10 years or 11 years in black jacket. I mean, it was quite cold. I think it was early spring. And he had a small Ukrainian flag attached to the button of the jacket. And I asked him, aren't you afraid uh, to wear uh, this uh, Ukrainian flag? And he said, no, I'm not afraid. Uh, all my uh, friends in the school are Ukrainian patriots. But our teachers are separatists. <laughs> But we are fighting with them. <laughs> At that time, actually, I was told that in this actual city, up to 80% of uh, locals are pro-Russians. But they are passively pro-Russians. I mean, they were more nostalgic about the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And Russia did a lot to actually make them even more nostalgic by promoting the TV channel Nostalgia, yeah. which broadcasts, even in America, black and white uh, programs from the Soviet times yeah. and the Soviet films. My parents love that. Well, I can imagine, yeah. And so when I went to Severodonetsk three years later, uh, it was like 50-50 already. And even those who were pro-Russian were coming to the events when the Ukra Ukrainian writers were giving talks or running discussions. Uh, the only thing was that if they wanted to ask a question, they would never ask the question aloud. They would approach you and whisper the question in the ear, at the same time looking around to check that nobody's listening to them. <laughs> So, I mean, there was evolution, and uh, the situation, of course, now is completely different. But uh, what I want to say that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the border between Ukrainian individualistic mentality and Russian-Soviet collective mentality was cut in Ukraine in half. But with every year, Ukrainian mentality was pushing Russian collective mentality to the east. And it's another interesting topic which might require a lot of time. But I mean, I just want to tell you that uh, uh, in the territories, mostly Western Ukraine and then later Central Ukraine, where Ukrainian mentality took over Russian mentality or Soviet mentality, there were much more private entrepreneurs than in the East. There were more self-confident people and the self-dependent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was like normal European way of life for them. And if we didn't have this war, in 20, 30 years' time, the border between mentalities would coincide with Russian-Ukrainian border, and then Putin wouldn't have pretext to fight against Ukraine. It didn't happen because probably he, he was in a hurry. I think he was motivated by the fact that he started controlling Belarus so easily. And his dream was definitely to restore, and is until today, while he is still alive, 
to restore the Soviet Union or Russian Empire. Because for 22 years, he was repeating one and the same phrase that his biggest personal drama, the main drama of his life, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Therefore, you can see what is his main dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this dream will be dead together with this dreamer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Well said. Death to the dream, death to the dreamer. Um, absolutely. Um, going off of that, what we were just talking about, I, I was wondering why, and I remember being in Kiev a couple of years ago, uh, uh, seeing you, and I remember walking around the streets of Kiev and hearing, I mean, a lot of the conversation was and probably still is in Russian. And it was one of the first times that I've been in a country that's both free and where I hear Russian everywhere. You know, I mean, I guess you could say Brighton Beach, but that's not really free. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I was wondering, why is it? I mean, you mentioned Belarus, and I know Belarus has been fighting also against the oppression of, of, of Lukashenko, this horrifying dictator. But how is it, and I think you've partly answered this question, but how is it that Ukraine, out of those three Eastern Slavic states, right, that Ukraine is the one that was able to overthrow during the, uh, the revolution, uh, during the latest revolution, uh, the Maidan, was able to overthrow these, uh, you know, these zhuliki, these, I don't know, crooks, uh, in a way that Russia and Belarus have not? Well, what happened uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the whole structure of Soviet life disappeared. Uh, and uh, most of people were disorientated, including my parents. They didn't know what to do, where to ask for help, etc. And in such a situation, actually, uh, people subconsciously and sometimes consciously, they are looking some kind of firm ground, new firm ground under the feet. So in their mentality, they are looking for the way to behave, to survive, which existed maybe on the same territory centuries ago. So, I mean, Ukrainians almost automatically went back to organized anarchy, to the Cossacks' time. And uh, not many people know that actually Ukraine was, uh, until 1654, independent from Russia. It was an independent territory without fixed borders because all the borders were front lines. Ukrainian Cossacks were fighting with Poles, with Turks, with Russians, sometimes together with Crimean Tatars against Poles, etc. At the same time, they had diplomatic service. And in the archives uh, of Istanbul, you can find correspondence between Turkish sultans and uh, Ukrainian Gatemans. Gatman was the leader of the army of Cossacks and leader of the state, and he was elected in Ukraine as well as higher officers. So actually, Ukrainians had democracy. They never had royal family. They never respected, uh, actually, the Gatman whom he, uh, they elected. Uh, I mean, they, they almost uh, genetically don't like any uh, authority. I mean, they didn't like paying taxes, of course. I mean, they are learning it now. <laughs> they don't like rules. I mean, if you tell something uh, to Ukrainians what they should do, they will usually do the opposite thing. So, I mean, it is individualistic mentality, and the best proof of it is the existence of 400 political parties registered in the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. For Ukrainians, it is easier to start a new party than to join the party of somebody else. <laughs> no, and that, that's why, actually, in this last 22 years, while... Putin remains Russian Tsar. Ukrainians had already five presidents and uh, they thrown, had thrown one out uh -huh. because they didn't like him at all. Uh, Russian mentality, Soviet, I mean, Soviet mentality was based on the Russian collective mentality. The matrix for this mentality is monarchy. Russia was always monarchy. Russians always loved their Tsars. If they were unhappy with the Tsar, they would kill him and love the next one. For them, the Tsar is the symbol of stability. That's why actually Soviets were crying several days after the death of Stalin, including those Soviets whose parents, relatives, children died in Gulag. I can imagine that actually all these 140 millions of Russians will cry several days after the death of Putin. Yes, yes, yes. And I hope there will be enough uh, uh, cameramen to, to film it, because, yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, it should be kept yeah. uh, in... Uh, I mean, there's a legacy of the mankind. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, no, I agree. I mean, yeah. one of my relatives, uh, a fairly dim-witted one, but when Stalin died, he said, you know, our father has died. And this is from a family that obviously lost people to Stalin, like every family. 
Uh, yeah, because no, nobody could imagine life after death after of Stalin. Death of Stalin yeah. And yeah. I, I assume that actually Russians cannot imagine life after I don't, death I think, of Putin. I think Putin. many of them can't. Yeah. I, no, I agree. I mean, and speaking of parties, uh, I remember driving into Kiev uh, on the way to the, from the airport, and there was, the parties are great. I began to just write them all down because there was an election season, there were billboards, and there was the, the free Wi-Fi party, which is excellent. The Dill party, for those who love Dill. Uh, it, it was truly fantastic. And, you know, you see Russia, there's United Russia and nothing else. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, you asked about Russian language. I mean, Russian language is spoken in many regions. I mean, Russian speakers are not necessarily pro-Russian people, but Putin thinks that actually if you speak Russian, you are obliged to follow Kremlin's policies and to love Russia yeah. as the motherland of the language. I mean, for me... Kremlin doesn't have copyright for the Russian language. <laughs> it's true, but yeah. But you're someone, obviously, who writes in Russian uh, and has a connection. Uh, well, Russian is your primary language. You speak many other languages. I've I learned... write also in Ukrainian. You're I published two books uh -huh. non of nonfiction in Ukrainian. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's wonderful. No. That's wonderful. I've been feeling lately, as, as somebody who was, who was born in Russia and, and, and you know, was taught to revere Russian culture above everything, even when we came to America, my parents would say, learn English, it's good for business, but you know, nothing's better than Chekhov, uh, and, and nothing is better than Chekhov. But at the same time, I feel myself, I don't know, it's just see, hearing these intercepts of Russian soldiers speaking, and I know they're speaking a very devalued kind of Russian, but having this language that I associate with culture being used as a language of aggression to this extent, it's a little hard to deal with. I imagine somebody, you know, with German origins living in abroad in 1939 or whatever. I mean, how do you, when is it, because a country like Germany also knows how to rehabilitate itself. Uh, Russia, I don't, I hope will one day rehabilitate itself, but history does not show that kind of propensity. How do you deal with a language that is now so associated with such monstrosity? Well, in 1972, when I was 11 years old, uh, in the fourth class in the school, I had to choose a foreign language to learn. And the choice was between English and German. And I said immediately, I will never s learn German because Germans killed my grandfather in the war. And actually, I learned German when I was 37. But I, I was learning German on the request of my Swiss German publisher. I, I, I think Ukrainians, even from Russian-speaking families, the kids, uh, they will not learn Russian. Yeah. They will not uh, take Russian as a language of culture or of mm -hmm. socializing. Because, I mean, now it is almost official language of the enemy. And for Russian-speaking intellectuals in Ukraine, it is a painful issue. Because, I mean, I, I, several times, actually, I caught myself trying to speak uh, not allowed in Russian in the street if somebody was speaking Ukrainian next to me because mm -hmm. I felt ashamed. ashamed I felt guilty. Yeah. And, I mean, this feeling of guilt comes regularly into my thoughts. That's incredible. Yeah, one of my best friends in, in St. Petersburg is of Ukrainian heritage, and he, he, the first words he sent to me, I am ashamed. You know, and I feel that that's a stigma that we all have to deal with. And, you know, but it's interesting when you read, even I went, you know, even if you look at Pushkin, there's a kind of imperial nature to some of his poems, and obviously that, that is the same with English poets and French poets, etc. But people have been talking about Brodsky, a poet many revere, and some of the very anti-Ukrainian things he wrote after the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, about Ukraine. And it's just shocking, I mean, that we also ignored it for so long, but it's in there. It's this... Well, I mean, there was always anti-Ukrainian sentiment in Russia, first of all, because of the difference in mentalities, because Ukrainians were not good builders of the communist society. Lenin, in fact, actually didn't trust Ukrainians and never visited Kyiv. He never went there. He knew that actually Ukrainians are not capable of becoming proper part of the future nation. His dream was actually to create Soviet nation instead of 140 minorities or different groups. And what was Soviet nation that would speak Russian language, wouldn't have any roots and traditions, and would behave just like, according to the book, maybe a book, according to the book by Lenin, but he wrote too, too many books in a way. And that's why Russia was, or Soviet Union was the most reading country. <laughs> yeah, even Brezhnev wrote a, wrote a bunch of memoirs that yeah. were collected in our uh, Stienka, our books. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but actually, I mean, all, all the tragedies which happened to Ukrainians in the Soviet times, they also collect, connected with this uh, different mentality because they didn't want to join collective farms. 
And this was the reason for 300 Ukrainian farmers and their families to be deported to Siberia. Then, I mean, the artificial famine of 1932-33, it was also actually, uh, it was punishment for Ukrainians because at the same time was there was famine in Volga region. And so the Red Army took all the produce, all the wheat from Ukrainians, moved it east, and Ukrainians were dying from hunger, about 7 million victims of this famine. The story repeated itself to smaller scale in 1947. So Russians, I mean, not all Russians, but mostly Russians actually didn't trust Ukrainians because they were different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So history repeating itself because now grain is being stolen from Ukraine. And, and, yeah, and sent by and, ship to other countries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing, I know we don't have too much time, but I wanted to talk about your work a little bit. Uh, in rereading some of your books and, and in reading uh, uh, Grey Bees, uh, I realized that your characters often have uh, very important relationships with animals. Uh, in Death and the Penguin, there is, of course, the eponymous penguin uh, with whom the character has a very close bond. Uh, in Grey Bees, there's... A, there's Truly, some, you must have really done some research on beekeeping, right? I was taking lessons in Lithuania from the <laughs> ex-minister of police uh, because he is a beekeeper. Okay. And, and I, I mean, I learned everything that I needed to learn for the book. That's incredible. You know, beekeeping is becoming kind of a, almost a hipster kind of thing now. Uh, people in Berlin are keeping bees on their balcony uh, as a, a sign of, I don't know, <laughs> something. Um, and, 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 but anyway, there's, there's a kind of, and, and, and Andre's book does a beautiful job of showing how somebody transports bees and lets them out into the wild uh, across Ukraine and the bees, I can't even begin to uh, explain how, how it happens, but it's, it's a beautiful kind of natural phenomena. So I was wondering why there is some connection to animals as kind of almost the best friends of some of your characters. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, animals and children are innocent. Mm. Uh, this, the other thing that actually every kind of animal has its own features and characters. I mean, like uh, penguins are the most Soviet animals. They're, they're, they're collective. They, they do the same sort of uh, walks, same uh, route, generation after the generation. If you separate one penguin from the group and put uh, him or her on an uninhabited uh, by other penguins island, he doesn't know where to go because I mean, he gets disorientated. Uh, and that happened to the Soviet people after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's a good... Uh, the bees are, uh, I mean, they, they, they are natural communists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why actually Sergei, my main character, who is uh, ex-miner in Donbass, I mean, he's a simple guy. He knows what is good, what is bad. He is hardworking, he was hardworking, and he respects bees for their being hardworking and not demanding Rise, pay rise or something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he considers actually the bees the only uh, life beings that uh, manage to create communist society and also he thinks that the ants are the only insects that manage to create socialist society. <laughs> and actually, I mean, people in Donbass, they were hardworking as bees and they were silent as bees and they never complained about... Uh, the life they had, which was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for each novel, and I have uh, published 24 novels, there is only, there are two novels without animals. Yeah. But one of them is without animals, but with Putin as a character. <laughs> so, with animals. Yeah. With animals, yeah. It's President's Last Love. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I like animals, but uh, uh, I analyzed myself much later, after already seven or eight novels with animals were written, why do I have animals? And I understood that because all my pets in childhood were very unhappy and they died tragically very often because of my neglect. So oh, I God. obviously uh, subconsciously tried to give them second chance on the pages of my books. This is a very Eastern European tale here. Uh. Um, yeah, I love exotic. I, my dream is to have a capybara, you know, which is yeah. the, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's the world's biggest rodent. Uh, it's this big. I went to Brazil just to visit it. It's so lovely. It's, it's got a sweetness. I can almost imagine you writing a capybara novel. Uh, so, you know, if you ever I have never it. seen one. You've never seen one? I'll show you a photo. Adorable. You didn't bring one here. I didn't bring one here. I have one upstate, uh, as everyone does, obviously. Um, 
Uh, so there's also a kind of loneliness that a lot of your characters have, which I mean in a very good sense, a kind of feeling of being apart, which I know many authors write about, but it, it feels, it doesn't feel cloying or kind of, you know, too, there's not too much pathos or bathos attached to it, but it does feel very real, that, the sense that they are alone in the world. Well, singularity of a character means that this character should find his way or her way. So, I mean, there is more motivation to do something. That's a good way. That's a good yeah, way. either to find the yeah. second part, yeah. second half, mm -hmm. or to find, find people who are thinking the same. So, I, uh, I think it's easier, it's easier to, to deal with one main character who is alone. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree. Yeah. Uh, last question I wanted to ask, we're almost out of time. Um, some really beautiful passages in Grey Bees about the Crimean Tatars, uh, and obviously all the repression that they faced uh, since Russia illegally took over Crimea. Uh, I grew up spending my vacations in Crimea, and I once, I remember there was a Tatar family that they had a little kind of, like a hut uh, where, where we lived, and I, I, even then I was fighting with the boy, now I feel so guilty of this kid from Leningrad fighting with a Tatar kid. See, that's my, that's my problem. <laughs> I didn't take care of uh, a potential friend. Uh, but I wanted to ask, you know, oh, did you go to Crimea under, when it was already occupied by Russia? To, no, to do research? but, but uh, I went to Crimea with my wife and kids on the 1st of January 2014, mm -hmm. and we stayed for eight or nine days uh, in, near Gurzuf. Oh, Gurzuf, that's where I went. Yeah. yeah. And that was our tradition, actually, in the yeah. family. Every time after New Year celebration on the next day to, to drive there or to take a train. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the annexation happened uh, six or seven weeks after we came back. And this was our last uh, visit to Crimea. But did you visit a Tatar village? Because you described yeah, it so yeah, yeah. well. I, I, okay. I mean, I have many okay. friends who are Crimean Tatars. Oh, you have many friends. Yes, 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 yes. And I was, uh, before... Uh, Maidan in October, I went to Crimea with my friend, Ukrainian writer Yurko Vinichuk, mm -hmm. and we met Crimean Tatars and we enjoyed their food and we were talking and we wanted to write a book together mm -hmm. with Crimea uh, featuring there. Uh, we did write a book together mm -hmm. in co-authorship, but almost without Crimea because Crimea was already annexed. Was yeah. yeah. Well, Andre, thank you so much. This has been so illuminating for me. Uh, Grey Bee, all of the books are incredible, but Grey Bees, I mean, if you're looking for a humane, humorous, very sweet, but very deep and in some ways angry as it should be book about uh, what has been happening right before this aggression, uh, it's just incredible. Um, and uh, I'm so happy that you've made it here to New York, and I really... Keep in touch with all of us, you know, let us know because we all we all care very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.